Hi, everybody who's joining. I'm Joan Hawkins, and we're going to wait a few more minutes to see if other people come. Welcome. Hello and good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight to um, to the first Wednesday Spoken Word series. And I'm going to put the I want to put the the um, this is the words. I'm going to try to put the running order in chat so that people can have a, a 
can have it. But for right now, I can say that the Spoken Word series, uh, the first Wednesday Spoken Word series is sponsored in part by the Indiana Arts Commission, the Bloomington Arts Commission and the Bloomington Urban Enterprise Association. And it is of course coordinated by the Writers Guild at Bloomington. I'm Joan Hawkins, I'm the chair of the Writers Guild at Bloomington. Um, the, the Writers Guild wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University and the city of Bloomington were built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi and Shawnee people as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. So I have some announcements to make. Um, we have a bunch of a sort of ongoing uh, series that happens uh, happens uh, every month throughout the month, and. Um, and so the first one is Third Sunday Write, which is a virtual place to find writing prompts and the company of other writers. You visit a private uh, Facebook page to respond to prompts that are posted, and you can then write and post any time during the month and offer a response to the writing of others. And if you would like to join the group or if you would like more information, please contact Shauna Ritter at Shauna747 at gmail.com. Uh, this Sunday, we will have our first Sunday prose reading and open mic over at Morgan Stearns. It goes from three to five. Our featured readers this month are Lisa Kwong and Susan Lepselter. And as I say, this is followed by an open mic. So please come and bring your, your uh, anything that you would like to read. We have our monthly business meeting on Saturday, March 19th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. And this, uh, this month we will have a last Sunday poetry reading an open mic uh, over at the Monroe County County Convention Center and that happens at 11 a.m. on Sunday March 27th. It'll be live and in person with guest poets Alex Chambers and Colleen Wells um, and it's also followed by an open mic. And finally mark your calendars because on uh, Saturday April Ooh, there's a typo here. So on the first Sunday of April, which is I believe April 2nd, but I'm looking for my book, uh, Brian Lung will be here, Grace of the Indiana Authors Grant from Indiana Humanities. He'll be live and in person. And that will be again at Morgan Stern Books on uh, Autumn Mall Road in the old Pier 1 Imports location. And he'll be doing a book event at the same time because he's going he is going, um, he's, he is, his book is coming out in March. And I see that it's Sunday, April 3rd, that this will be happening three to five at Morgan Stearns. Okay, so tonight we have a, a wonderful musician and three poets, or two poets and a filmmaker, actually. And so we'll be starting tonight with Damon Smith, whose explorations into the sonic palette of the double bass have resulted in a personal, flexible, improvisational language based in the American jazz avant-garde movement and European non-idiomatic free improvisation. He's collaborated with a wide range of musicians, including Taylor, Marshall Allen of Sun Ra's Orchestra, uh, Henry, Henry Kaiser, Keith Rao, Yap Blanc, Roscoe, Roscoe Mitchell, Michael Pizarro, Barada Leo Smith, Weasel Walter, Marco Anita, Wolfgang Fuchs, Peter Brutzmann, and Peter Kowald. Damon has uh, run the record label Balance Point Acoustics since 2001, releasing music focusing on transatlantic collaborations between US and European musicians, and he's quite wonderful. So please join me in welcoming Damon Smith. Thank you. 
It always takes me a while to find my reactions. Thank you very much, Shannon. That was lovely. So um, I put the running order in chat. If you are on Zoom, you should be able to see it. And so basically it'll be um, Karen George will read for 10 minutes and then Jason, Jason, <coughs> excuse me, Jason Baldinger will be reading for another 10 minutes and I will be introducing each of them before their sets. We'll have some more music. Then we'll have another set from Jason and another set from Karen. And there will be a film by Gilbert Nadayo, um, sort of after that second set of poets. And then one last round of uh, poetry and a final, a final word from, uh, from Damon. So, uh, so we'll start with uh, Karen George is the author of five chapbooks most recently an ekphrastic collaborative chapbook, Frame and Mount the Sky, that came out from Finishing Line Press in 2017. And three poetry collections from Dos Madres Press, Swim Your Way Back from 2014, A Map and One Year from 2018, and Where Wind Tastes Like Pears 2021, that's a lovely title. Her work has appeared in Adirondack Review, Nagatok River Review, Valparaiso Poetry Review, Indianapolis Review, Sheila Nagig, Tipton Journal, and Poet Lore. She's received grants from Kentucky Foundation from Women and the Kentucky Arts Council and holds an MFA in writing from Spalding University. After 25 years as a computer programmer and analyst, she retired to write full time. She enjoys photography and visiting museums, cemeteries, historic towns, gardens, and bodies of water. And she has a website that I'll also put up in the chat that is uh, karenlgeorge.blogspot.com. So, Karen. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Tony and Joan and the Bloomington Writers Guild and, and all who support this reading. I'll start with some poems from my third uh, full length collection, Where Wind Tastes Like Pears. It was published in August, and um, this is what it looks like. And the poems are meditations on imagination, memory, wildness, and wonder how we connect and transform seen through the landscape of dreams. This is the first poem in the book and it's a cento composed from lines and phrases in Jane Hirschfield's collection, Given Sugar, Given Salt. In the dream, the ears drink and drink like lapping panthers. Perhaps it is not the outcome, but the listening under the surface, something that whispers only when I am quiet for a long time. Ululations and whinnies, throat clearings, cheeps, alien hums and whistles, scratchings, the first branch tips brush at the window, a mockingbird song, a dog howling at time, the clink of a soup spoon against soup bowl, 
the ringing a stone or violin or empty bucket gives off, the bump of a kind of hope against its lock. Let them linger as almost meaning, the thing already ambered, capable of waiting, turns to words, words like river pebbles, some black, some white, some sigh with pleasure, a sentence repeating itself in my ear, the almost audible valves of my heart. This next poem is a found poem I created from page one of Virginia Woolf's novel, To the Lighthouse. Night's Lark. Picture a mother who transfixes crystals to the fringe of her child's blue dress to ward off sorrow and frailty. They speak a secret language that sounds like a lark's radiance. The child sits in a hooded wheelbarrow turned toward tomorrow. They will leave for an expedition of wonder once a clan of six rooks appears to power their course. This next poem is also created from Virginia Woolf's novel, To the Lighthouse, page 149. And this wasn't an actual dream I had, but it echoes so many of my dreams where a loved one returns from the dead for a visit. I love hearing those dreams. Night Vapors. You come back from the dead, covered in lilies, cupping light. The kitchen contracts, loosens from the house, Books and doors burst open. Your voice catches me. I wake in a tide of wonder. The source text I used for the next two poems were poems by Bridget Pajean Kelly. Quiet Flight. Two persons on a porch, a limp fan whistles on high. The woman paints a field of purple asters, a body gone soft beneath a tree of golden lamps. The man stares at a book, blind to the black wave pulling her under, the old damage, poison dripping from a broken seal. The low pitch of a crow pollutes the quiet, cows moo across river, she places water, a shiny ribbon, feathers in a dark scarf plummeting through blue, a red gate, a lime bush, a sign that pledges night and stars ahead. This one's called Night Prow. You dream a cave, the air heady as hyacinths. A woman carves a holy bird out of wax beside a man who plays a flute. A last grasp at, for forgiveness at the edge of its melancholy bleat. But the thick chalk of memory shudders her like the sounds a tight lock makes or when a shovel lands on stone. Besides erasure, the twinned caged heart houses mercury and teeth. These next two poems are actual dreams that I've had. This one is called Dilemmas after watching the documentary Wild Madagascar. Imagine 60 million years ago, the first lemurs floated on matted plants to an island cleaved from a continent now they're endangered by logging and the poor who eat them. I dream of lemurs thriving in Kentucky. At dusk, they descend from pine, locust, shagbark hickory, cross the sliding glass threshold I keep open, line up in clans led by matriarchs, litter shards of nutshells, pine cones, cricket and beetle legs. They groom with tooth comb and tongue, climb my books, piles of poems, snort, chirp, shriek, purr, 
tiny mouse lemurs to tall, ring-tailed and eye-eye, long middle fingers tap-tapping. I wake, wishing all adaptation that easy. In river dreams, I'm always going under. Brakes fail, the bridge unbuckles or climbs higher, higher. And when I reach the summit, no way down, but to nosedive toward the shine. No time to eject before impact. Metal collapses in, the crush suck catapults me out into cold, dark plush heavy on my head. Clouds of sediment churn when I frog kick off the bottom, arms overhead, body a bullet. Oh, the rising toward light that tendles down. My kicks thick as the muck, the musk metallic like blood, chest ache of lungs longing. Oh, the breakthrough. Nails of my fingers pierce the river skin, scrim that hems air. The dream ends before I thrash my arms, throw my voice across water to a triangle in the inlet, the boat that will turn for me. This is another found poem that I created from Maggie Smith's poem, Vanishing Point. In a forest clearing, a woman speaks to a downy deer. He swallows yellow flowers from her hand. She tells him twitchy stories, blue stillness, ancient stars, fur, cake, rain, how to smell his way, when to lurk and vanish in the braided dark. And this next found poem was composed from Snow White and Rose Red by Andrew Lang in the Blue Fairy Book. In Sleep's Cape, some nights she's a woman in a house made of logs wedged with mud, seated fireside, piecing a dress of quail wings and air, tender leaves and milk teeth, needle piercing in, out, catches, scatters light. Sometimes she becomes a butterfly, folds herself, settles on a branch in warm sun, or she scissors the air open, closed. At night clings to a cave shared with a bear. Her feet perceive root, stream, berry in his musty fur. Or she's a man diving into a body of water the cold a blade seizes, turns him into a bearded angelfish, red with black ribboned fins. He hovers for prey. By a kitchen window, a widow muddles moss, ashes, wizened grasshoppers, mutters words pearled with hurt. Spinning a wand, she lands, binds a wish, entangles a hazel-eyed, shuddered lover. Some nights she wakens buttered with wonder. Others, the precipice calls her name, voice laced with longing. Thank you. Those were great, they were powerful. I loved what you were doing with the found poetry, I must say. Um, Jason, our next reader is Jason Baldigner. He's a poet from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a former writer in residence at Osage Arts Community. He is co-founder and co-director of the Bridge Series. He has multiple books available, including The Better Angels of Our Nature from Kung Fu Treachery, and Everyone's Alone Tonight with James Banger, Kung Fu Treachery Press, as well as The Chap of Blind Into Leaving, Analog Submission Press. His work has been published widely in print journals and online, and you can listen to him read his work on Bandcamp and on LPs by the bands Their Monster and Go To Beds. So please join me in welcoming Jason. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Baldinger from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
first part of this reading, I'm going to give you uh, stuff from recent books. This is called A Threadbare Universe. It came out at Christmas of 2020. Uh, and this poem is called The Night the Incredible Hulk Got Stoned. <laughs> Margaret's laugh is musical. Profound as space, four smoke halos echo in a six by nine bathroom. If there's any space left, we laugh at full. The Incredible Hulk traces laser beam cherry hand over hand. Adults hide from adulthood in a basement. Next giraffe up to blow smoke into a hole in the ceiling that may be a vent that takes joy out into the night. There, nobody knows the true story of country music or how to live your life shambling. Beautiful. But we can dream before the spark is gone, before the air freshener comes, the laughter dissolves. If you're out there, Bruce Banner, you can be sure we left no trace. This next poem is called When Cancer Comes to Evansville, Indiana. She says they stayed in casinos every night and they ate like kings. Steaks, all you can eat crab legs, the best pork chop she ever had. She shovels mashed potatoes with white gravy in her mouth, asks when the waitress's surgery is, and they speak in hushed tones. The conversation breaks down into promises of future prayers. When cancer comes to Evansville, Indiana, mortality is another strong wind lost in the yellow flowers that stain the fields here every May. Mortality is just another wave on the Ohio. In this particular book, The New Prophets of Poetic Discord, and Even If We Did So What is the subtitle. It's a four-way split between myself, Sean Pavey, Damian Rucci, and Nathaniel Stolte. This is a poem called The Hymn to Chicory Hill. That blood-red lit neon is the only light in the darkness of Chicory Hill. Jesus saves, floods the windshield, floods the highway, and maybe tonight he does. Hang a left. In the turning lane, headlights spin U-turns, gravel pop pop until the car drifts to park. Ascend the steps of Golgotha, spread arms in moonlit and red, reach for the knob, the hem of his garment, only to find it locked. Jesus may save, and this place may offer sanctuary, but only during business hours. And this monstrosity, a history of backroads misplaced, selected poems 2010 to 2020, which just came out Christmas of this year. Uh, and this poem is called Fuck You, Jay Gatsby. A squall to stop midnight strong hearts, although the fury is barely an inch. Out of the bar, snow globe streetlights, and I offer her a ride. She says she has to go to her car. Her car where she lives now, although she sleeps with a man she thought she had something with. Now it's just a bed to go to when there's nowhere. Tonight, there is nowhere. Tonight, there is snow. We glide downhill laughing our asses off. The times are hard. Hell, we've been laughing for years, ever since Regent Square apartments, up until four laughing and drinking. But shit, the times never got any better anywhere or Sciota Street. She grabs two sweaters, boots, and then abandons boots. Alcohol braces wind chill. It's hard to believe it's December. It's hard to believe one's life fits in a trunk. It's hard to believe a college degree ain't getting anyone anywhere. It's paper. There's no money in it. There's no money in anything. We scrape our change to laugh, laugh, gaspies, abandoned children, lost in America, the beautiful nowhere. She said if it was summer when she took her last final, she'd have driven until the car died and called wherever home. And they think about North Carolina afternoons, waiting storms out in pizza shops, talking about how the dead they don't come back and how it never gets any easier to whistle with cotton mouth. We slide uphill, the last buses whine, electronic voices, canned stops, U-turns, wipers push snow, the road is a tenuous ice swirl. South Pacific, she gets out. The snow will swallow her. As the door creaks, 
or in the wind through the vents, I'm sure I hear something rasp. Fuck you, Jay Gatsby. All right. If I can get to the next poem, that's not it. But that is, it's called Like Neil Young in Albuquerque. The couple at the door see my shirt and ask if I brought the rain. If I knew them better, I'd say, in this town, rain has a habit of following you. The thing you can't shake, solitary, dark clouds at your heels endlessly. And today I feel like Neil Young in Albuquerque, wanting breakfast, a joint, and anonymity. I felt this way for several seasons, clawing and uncomfortable, something I can't shake, so instead I ease into it, half measures. The waitress yawns and waits for order up. I used to come here with my grandfather, weekly dinners in the wake of my father's death, his best attempts to be part of our lives, but never knowing how to relate. Think about my father, who if you ask him what he wanted for breakfast, he would always say, eggs benedict. I never saw him order it. Strange that even at the far end of our cities, we still find our histories glaring. While eating eggs, Benedict, I wonder if turning 40 has anything to do with this feeling. Age puts weight on you, and I mean that metaphorically. I consider my father dead over 30 years, my grandfather gone over 20. I consider generations all the boughs of a bloodline tree. Red-shirted cooks spin around an open range, an array of Belgian waffles, of strawberries and eggs, of toast, of home fries a la carte, of Greek omelets appear out of the tornado, the ballet, the flicker of fire. This furnace glows indelible forever. A young black kid and an old marine bus, and when they pause, I see the same look on their face, the indignity of work, the pain of physical labor. Is it a muscle memory or a generational memory? Our dreams squeezed out of us by doing so much for nothing. The rain has mostly stopped. The couples cringe under their umbrella. And I could cross the bridge to take when things get serious and then turn around at the North Versailles L welcome sign before I cross it again. The Edgar Thompson works looks the same as it does on the cover of Jack Gilbert's Tough Heaven. And his poems flash, but one line surfaces. We find the heart by dismantling what the heart knows. I have two more for you. This is called The Great American Apple Pie Fight. I found Snow White, Seven Dwarfs, Spider-Man, Laurel and Hardy, and the Blues Brothers, dancing while holding still outside the Petersburg Chamber of Commerce. All the while, Lee Greenwood sang the chorus of proud to be an American on an endless fucking loop. And I was moved. No, really, I was moved. It was like I had an apple pie fight with God. And this last poem is called Blind and Believing. I'm drinking beer in a bourbon town again. The waitress raised eyebrows suspicious. I lock eyes on an alligator and a shark. The beltways of Kentucky are kind. No stress, no trucks, no cops. Set the cruise just north of 80. The miles dissolve easy. Still, I dive into bourbon now. I'll be slobbering in moments. There are things that you can't drink away. The guitar player works Statesboro blues, more almond than Mattel. The sunset was rose water in the rear view tonight, and I wanted to hold my breath. The waitress wants to know if I need another. Babe, I need an IV. And she sees that, and she tells me that these are good people. I took three tries to get a room. The lobby was full bloom Appalachian floor show, every toilet full of shit. The waitress brings me my third and I down it in one magic swallow. Broke down engine guzzles gasoline. The wizard guitarist is onto finger style sweet leaf. I tip and walk blind into leaving. Thank you.
Those were fantastic. Thank you so much. So we are coming back now to our um, improvisational jazz bassist extraordinaire, Damon Smith, for a 15 minute set. So Damon, take it away. Thank <laughs> you. 
It's fantastic, thank you. So for the next two, um, the next two sets, uh, Jason Baldinger will read first for about 10 minutes and then Karen will follow him for about 10 minutes. And if you two could just tip into each other since I've already introduced you. And then I'll introduce, after Karen, I'll introduce uh, Gilbert Nadayo's film. So first up is Jason Baldinger. And with the second set, we're gonna move to newer work. Damon, that was fantastic. I uh, was very much reminded of some of the great free jazz bases I've seen like William Parker and, and uh, Henry Grimes. So thank you for reminding me of some of those shows. Uh, so these next poems are mostly somewhat new. This is called That Been Her Life. The interstate chariot race hurries empty miles, becomes competition. There's no salvation in beating a GPS. No horse shit, just roadkill. If you're lucky, you may find white Jesus waving an American flag calling racers to pit stop. Me, 
I prefer green corn. Acres and acres, eye high, deep in July. Red-winged blackbirds watch over two lanes, watch waves across the sea. It's 12.15, and I didn't follow orange detours. I made my own inventory of one-stop sign towns, Odell, Linden, Romney. A music box amplifies God bless America across Crawfordville, Hayes. Oh, Kate Smith. Let's get earnest across those fruited plains until the roads give out in an ocean white with foam. How did the jukebox selected of one rebel Jew pervert to the American dream death cult ethos? Oh, that been her life. I felt his voice take the sword out of my hand. I'll take Lou Welsh instead. Those who can't find anything to live for always invent something to die for. I have hours to go, to drift under the current of a future harvest. There's a thunderstorm in my pocket for safekeeping. Maybe I'll dust it off come the next state line. The next poem can only be prefaced by saying, I didn't ever think I'd write a Van Halen poem. It's called Civic Arena, March 7th, 1984. Snow on the dash. Snow crunches under the tires of a 77 rabbit. Her friend's boyfriend with a handful of pills to share. She plastered a pint in her jeans. Security never looked anyway. Into the dark of the floor, fog machine smells, the pills slowing down, speeding up together, Diamond Dave, glitter blur and fuzz from this far away, running with the devil into eruption, and she never cared for those long solos, but whiskey and counting 23 times for the word jump. It's infinity. What's infinity? drunk enough on her boyfriend's shoulders, arms up gigantic as they tore in to ain't talking about love. The last song and everything is spinning. Freedom is a ghost waiting to go numb. The post office ain't the same. Wild once, there ain't nothing wild left of what remains. That'll be in a future collection with James Benger called This Still Life. It should be out come May. I think this poem is also in that collection. It's called Panther Hollow Lubrication. It wasn't the night security almost caught him pissing in a potted plant. It was wild turkey and PBR, Panther Hollow Lubrication, mostly competent velvet underground covers. Here comes the ocean. The reverend was blackout, blotto into the wall outside his apartment, fractured his wrist, a fact hidden until the next day. That winter was mid-shelf, bottom-shelf tours. The snow would come the next night 25 inches deep. My housemate and I run the Penn Avenue I did a rod to DJ a Valentine's shindig. We tried the neutral slide down 40th and couldn't, bailed into an open grocery. If the weather wanted hostages, at least we'd have limes. In the snow drift dunes, in the ice hole days to come, no one would show to the next gallery. That show was canceled. The touring band talked about nothing except Jared Leto. And maybe you don't know this, but Leto owns a decommissioned military base in the Laurel Canyon, not far from where Charles Manson was employed by the CIA to kill what they call the 60s. Decades are decorations, skim surfaces of memories blurred on the precipice of collateral damage and barely keeping shit together with another hangover close at hand. In nicotine and suicide attempts, the Reverend was right. Don't get your hopes up. All right. This next poem is called The Next Longest Train. You might say it was laudanum that led Alexander Creel to believe the Virgin Mary was standing on the banks of the Ohio past a river island in a land then called Virginia, even though it was probably a mothman, a thunderbird, or a blur in the bright of steam. I mean, laudanum was all 
the rage. Just ask Meriwether Lewis, who was shooting bears in his nightshirt before he turned that muzzer loader on himself, making a mess of the walls of an inn in Grinder's Switch, which is still in Tennessee. Coal dust chokes summer sun, and the next longest train I ever saw rattles down Maine. It's 2.45 in the afternoon. Heaped cars stretch long past the food giant sign that adorns the hardware store. I sip sweet tea on a bench. The engine disappears into the wetlands at the edge of town. This is where I live now, in the shadow of history, in the shadow of a coal train, somewhere in a portal between past and present, the future lost or locked away. I wish I could say the view from here was anything but bleak. And I have two more poems. This one is called Painkillers and Double Shift Towns. She works mornings at Kroger's, cashier bringing orders, everyone she went to high school with, everyone else that got stuck. She leaves her daughter at daycare and later grandmother picks up granddaughter after her job, takes her home, plants her in front of the TV. She leaves Kroger's for evening shifts, waiting at the barbecue pit downtown. Her grandmother falls asleep while granddaughter plays in front of the TV. Morgan's raid, like the Civil War, came to nothing. The men in this town are trash. They stink of imposed failure the way you can when you're under the thumbs of a dream that says all you got to do is try and you will succeed. We all know it's bullshit. But have you ever tried to convince yourself out of some kind of propaganda? She's all eyes as I finish my second beer. I've been sleeping on the ground all week. I like the attention. She rests her hip on my shoulder, pronounces my name off guard flirting. She has the giggles. And I'll debate a minute, waking up in a room disheveled in that two jobs and single mom way, and that she'll never catch up with. And I think about her pouring cereal and milk, trying to get her daughter to eat before rushes for drop-offs. Another day and another pair of shifts. Another day too tired. Work and TV and sleep. Automation. And I'll tuck my wallet and shuffle out the front door. She's crying on the, on the steps next to the cook, overwhelmed. I'll spend the night sleeping on the ground, counting spiders in O'Bannon's woods. In the morning, I'll follow the river west through painkillers and double shift towns. The Ohio River is only water. It can't save anyone. And I have one last poem for you. This is called, let me get it to come up here. Fighting. Called Let Go of Atlantis. It'll be in a chapbook called uh, The Topography of Disappearing, which I believe comes out uh, April 1st. Let Go of Atlantis. Jerry believes in ivory soap. He believes in starched collars. His spine is straight. He says all the flying plagues of Florida are nearsighted. Don't give them room to smell. I miss the manatees out in a cove near the launch pad that's etched in our consciousness. I see rockets in the rear view, and I want to write about shoveling snow as a boy, about dreams exploding, about hot cocoa and Krista McAuliffe. Jerry says for 15 bones, they'll give me a sea kayak, and I can paddle over the surf to a barrier island all my own. Out there, cooking hamburger helper over a pocket rocket, I'll turn back ahead time. I'll forget my couth and go native. Going native is a racist term meant to minimize the people who were killed so this land could be our land, a universe of violence. It seems that every inch of this land is steeped in blood, and I wonder if a barrier island off the coast of the Atlantic may be one of the few places where I can step where that blood doesn't well up, a hot spring of unacknowledged history. I'm going to stay out here, an island a mile away from civilization. The sun paints the sky every 12 hours, 
Every day the ocean steps a little higher, and when it reaches my neck, I'll know it's time to let go of Atlantis. Karen, if you're ready, please hit us with some more lovely poems. Okay. I'm going to read some poems from an almost finished collection inspired by paintings of Georgia O'Keeffe, Frida Kahlo, and Emily Carr, who were contemporaries of each other. Emily Carr was a Canadian painter who lived in British Columbia, and she did many paintings to document the, <clears throat> the disappearing totem poles of the indigenous peoples that originally inhabited that land. This is a poem titled, Emily Carr's The Great Eagle Skittigate, 1929. And it has an epigraph from her book, Growing Pains. Quote, his physical conception, he buried deep in the woods he was about to carve. Everything pointed, sharp, towering totem cocooned in a glass sky, shattered into a puzzle of prisms. The fur's barbed crowns, the eagle's beak, wingtips, staccato, slap of flying, the shredding talons not visible. Cedar aged a rich bronze and steel blue as if morphing into sky, petrifying. Large eyes, deep set, mouth, a wide grimace. From his perch, he scans all creation face in shadow, an intense tilt to his head. Has he spotted prey, ready to lunge and stab, or does he stare in disgust at what the world's become? Emily Carr also filled many canvases trying to embody the wildness and wonder of British Columbia's forest. This poem is inspired by her 1931 painting titled Gray. Dense layers of dark forest rise like spires, converge. Deep color, the oldest trees at the edges, less intense young ones near the center, nested one inside the other, branch and foliage and thick tents, flaps open to reveal an illuminated seedling cocooned in a pearly veil. Igneous light divulges a path, a passage out, past the beating heart. This poem is titled Georgia O'Keeffe's Pattern of Leaves, 1923, and it has two parts. One, they fill the frame, intense, close as a palm raised to your face, deeply veined, collage of layers, background smoke, three leaves overlaid one on another. Between one only ruffled edges, a gray green shadow, middle leaf white as if furred with mold, the top dark maple the color of Merlot, in places almost black like dried blood, a vertical cut clean through the pulp, zigzag of a lightning strike, yellow in the wound, break of sunlight, exquisite, obscene, a plump heart yanked from a body. Two, a torn heart. Three, the slash so clean hints leaf cutter ants voracious hunger that consumes in minutes, flesh-eating driver ants in the poison wood Bible, a village runs for the river. Four, is it hard to paint violence, to form that jagged gash, nearly disconnect one half from the other, to scar beauty, inflame it? And this one's 
titled Georgia O'Keeffe's Pelvis III, 1944. The bleached pelvis devours the frame, raised to sky, a telescope. The blue blooms through the bone hole, breach calves birth through. Imagine its hooves pounded earth in glee, terror, or a soft shelled robin's egg just laid, hoarded in a hollow of white sand, oval balm form within form, a nesting. Ten years ago, near an abandoned stone born, born the skeletal head of a fox, sharp teeth intact in pointed snout, I place fingers in a nasal cavity, an eye socket, where ears once sensed mice stir in a burrow, rabbits rustle grass, feel inside its jaw for the missing sinewy tongue. An ache thrums my throat, grief for all the absent ones, hum of connection. This is titled after Frida Kahlo's Henry Ford Hospital or the Flying Bed, 1932. Frida, not everyone wants to see you unclothed on a hospital bed in the open air, industrial Detroit on the horizon, blood puddling beneath you, clutched in your hand, long umbilical cords attached to floating objects, model of the female reproductive system, a snail, an orchid, your pelvis fractured in a bus accident when you were 18, and the male fetus you miscarried. Miscarried, an odd word, miss wrongly, to carry wrongly, as if you chose an incorrect way to carry your unborn son. When shown, in a New York exhibit six years later, your painting was titled The Lost Desire. I never desired to have children. People don't want to believe that. I've been told a marriage is invalid unless it results in children. Schooled as a preteen by the faith I was raised in, procre procreation the only purpose for sex. Even then, I knew bullshit when I heard it. This is a hard poem to write. I wish your son had lived. Frida, 30 years after your death, ecstatic to buy my first book of your art, a male clerk slid repulsed eyes over its cover. Mouth squinched up like he'd bit into an extra sour lemon wedge. I never cared for her, he stated, eyes lowered. I pretended not to hear his unwanted opinion. What I wanted was to slap his face, utter a few curses. This is another poem titled after Frida Kahlo's painting, The Love Embrace of the Universe, 1949. A triangle of connection, nested babushka dolls, worlds to clasp, Sun, moon, music, art, words, dance, forests, lakes, loves, never ending realms within realms to layer, seem, embroider our lives, smother pain and fear, hurl us safe in intricate webs. If only we can remember the ways we are embraced the fervid green of soft moss, violin, harp, and cellos, liquid lilt, pierce of lilac and lily of the valley, how water cradles us silky thick. Our first date, the tenor of your voice as you sang to me, blue notes tickling the plush dark. I'm going to read some poems now from an in-progress collection about family stories, home, 
caretaking, aging, and memory. All night long, I dream of paintings. Massive canvases drift past me, hundreds, portraits, landscapes, abstracts. I want to purchase three, but fail to narrow the choices. A woman with violet hair floats in a cobalt sky. Stars land in her palms. Mist lifts from a lake near sunrise. Outward expanding ripples shimmer. Dizzying swirls of triangles, ribbons, teardrops of turquoise, fuchsia, chartreuse, a vibrating spiral. To parchment, I add pigment, a watercolor of rhombus, trapezoid, ellipse, lattice like a writhing school of fish clustered close. I wake, a knee, hip, shoulder aching, swim back into the sea of color, shape, pattern, texture. My mother appears in her mid-teens, light auburn hair. Seated at an easel, she paints herself playing a piano, rendition of when she auditioned for dad's band. She dabs silver on the skirt folds of her emerald satin swing dress. Her fingers curve over ivories arrayed on either side, the white open palm of her life. This one is titled March 16th, 2021. The crocus first in my yard to bloom, purple with tiny orange kernel, blossom within blossom, Ground saturated from a foot of snow three weeks ago. Now magnolia, white feathered with pink stripes. Furry gray green sepal that open from. The way sun filters through slim petals. Spring's early yellows, witch hazel, forsythia, daffodils, meadow buttercups air fertile, dense with pollen and birdsong, trails a mud fest. Yesterday on the first anniversary of my mother's passing, I find three socks fallen in the narrow space between washer and stationary tub. Two mine, lost a year or more, the other a white anklet, my mother's name, Vivian, printed in permanent black ink when she moved to a nursing home. Bone white, so soft in my palm, a dove. Thank you. Let's <clears throat> just really beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Um, so our next, um, the next thing that we'll be seeing is a film by Gilbert Nadayo. And uh, Gilbert migrated to New York City in 2008 from Rwanda. His debut short film, Scars of My Days, premiered on the French channel Television Saint Monde and at the Tribeca Film Festival. Nadayo was compelled to foray into documentary filmmaking after meeting his parents' murderers. With the outbreak of the Rwandan genocide in his youth, his parents and 53 members of his immediate family were massacred. Nadayo channeled his experiences into developing and producing several documentaries about the genocide he survived. And he is the first Rwandan to be nominated for the African Movie Academy Awards. Gilbert Nadayo's debut autobiographical documentary film, Rwanda Beyond the Deadly Pit, will be screened this Sunday, March 6th at 7 p.m. at the Buskirk Chumley Theater in Bloomington for locals. And ticket information is available at the uh, Buskirk Chumley Theater box office. Now tonight we're gonna be seeing a short film called Dirty Wine. And the synopsis that I have is that after owning a bar, Nadine is courted by the son of a rich man in town. So I hope you enjoy this film. Thank you. 
Man, I am going to use one stone to eat two birds in water. One stone, two birds. I mean two girls in water. Hold on. Hmm? Hold on. I mean two stones in water. Eh? Did you see that? Yes, I did. Can you handle the difference? Um, I prefer the shallow end. I'll join you later. I think I need a cigarette. You sure? Yeah. Okay, go, go for it. Go for it. One stone with two parts. I mean, two stones in water. The girls. <laughs> go for the cigarette. I like them. Are they your drawings? <laughs> Nadine, I thought you were more interested in me. So, do you own this place? This? Uh, actually, my father rents it out for me. He owns several businesses, and uh, he's a member of parliament. Does that mean he's rich? But he also owns his pockets in politics. Oh, God. Oh, let, let me just find you something to eat, huh? Your parents? My parents died in the genocide. And um, I could not afford to go in with my education. So I decided to sell the remains of my parents' house to own a bar. is full of babas, mm -hmm. mysteries, and connection. So, are we connected? Sorry to you about your parents. I should not be telling you this. Many people don't know what happened. Nadine, is there somebody in your life? The boy I love is in the army. It's very hard for both of us to make both ends meet. Uh, I think I should get you a drink. No, I thought I would stay for a few minutes just because he insisted. No, come I on. I I'm not a crocodile. Can I get you a drink? At your bar, you reserve me extra beer. All right, then. I'll appreciate red wine if you don't mind. Okay.
Drink rice, have you, please? Uh, give me a cold beer. Very cold. Uh, Nadine. How did you know my name? <laughs> no, it's okay. Never mind. For the first time, I was ready to bring the traffic by giving the opportunity. I have been so vigilant for a long time, but I decided to drop my guts. In a single incident, he was the one to drink his dirty wine. I dare not tell what happened when he woke up. I learned so much, funny love's like a bone of bed. That's my word, baby, yeah, come on. Can't go nowhere without her by my side. When I need to talk, she's there with time, feel me. If you don't, I'm a come on me. Take your time, watch me. I'm a fan of her, some shit. I just control my destiny. Can't do nothing, love the same. You deserve better. Okay, I don't know if Gilbert is here, but that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so we're entering into the final, the final round. So uh, Jason and Karen will each do a kind of a flash, uh, flash round. Jason will do a poem first, and then Karen will do a poem, and then we'll close out with some more music with the wonderful Damon Smith. So, um, Jason, do you want to start up? Oh, I'm ready. Uh, thank you for having me. By the way. Here and see everyone. And this poem is called The Oxbow on the Sheep Scott. Ocean Point Sunset, then the Christmas lights of Booth Bay, and shrines for the dead are lost in the empty expanse of a pizza shop. He sports a Fu Man shoe through 30 years of photos, the wall memories, his daughters work the counter, a Greek sisterhood blessed, heredity offers the same no. I got a cold bottle of Coke watching the down jackets and duck boots grab an easy pre-holiday meal, ice down the stress until tomorrow. The last table reserved for the Virgin Mary, the dead. Photos and prayer candles, I can match the photos and then watch them disappear. Photos slowly fading in the current of time. I'm waiting to hear my name. 
so I can shuffle off into the night, white box on the front seat through the glowing lichen dark, find the oxbow on the sheepscot that lies beyond the last dream, blue sand still on my boot. Thank you. Oh, so. Hi, I want to thank also thank you, um, everyone, for being such sweet listeners. I've enjoyed what everyone has written or played. This is a poem about my deceased husband, Lou. It's called Rewound. You're rushed to the ER, can't breathe. X-rays reveal your right lung collapsed. Doctor asks if you've had a bad car crash because your left lung looks as if it was crushed a long time ago. Imagine our surprise when you retell the story and realize the army never divulged your lungs condition. If they had, would you have stopped smoking, lived past 63? 42 years ago, an explosion. You wake from a week, weeks long coma in an army hospital, learn a landmine catapulted the Jeep into the river. The driver drowned. The dog dragged you to shore by your uniform. I envision you, envision you in that open air vehicle, a fellow soldier driving beside you, the unit's adopted dog snug in the back cargo space. You're only 18. The sun hot on the khaki covering your shoulders echoes the feral musk of the dog's coat and the muddy scent of the river stretching ahead of you like your life. Thanks. Oh, that was wonderful. It was fantastic, really fantastic. And Damon, do you want to take this out? Yeah, it's been great to hear everyone. Great to hear all the poems and everything. And I'm gonna, um, most of my work is improvised and uh, certainly with other people, I don't like to play. If someone felt like I need to tell someone what to do, I'd rather just not play with them rather than write a composition. But I'm gonna play a composition at the end of this um, by a great piano player who was also an incredible poet. And it's a crime that there's not a book of his poems published after he's gone, uh, the great Cecil Taylor. And it's a composition for sextet, mm -hmm. it's like that. And I'm just gonna play it solo bass and then we'll be done. And thanks everybody for listening and for reading and everything. It's been a really great night. Okay, here we go. And it's untitled, it's called Untitled. It was recorded by the saxophone player Marco Aniti. Uh, on a sextet record with William Parker, who was listed earlier uh, by Jason and uh, uh, the other bass player, uh, Wilbur Morris, Karen Bork on bassoon and the drummer Jackson Crawl. But I'm just gonna play it by myself. All right. <laughs>
All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you to all of our readers and to our musician and our filmmaker. Uh, so I wanted to make just a couple of announcements to end. Uh, one is that all the information that I announced at the uh, top of the uh, top of the uh, set tonight, and and all our other information is available on our website, which is Writers Guild Bloomington, all one word, dot com. You can also get information by liking or following what following us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And also, if you go to our website, you can sign up for our newsletter that comes out sort of about once a week, depending on how busy my life is. That gives you information about the Writers Guild and other related uh, news about um, the literary arts and spoken word. And next month, for first Wednesday, which will be April 6th, we will have uh, as our poets, there will be Ohio Beat Poet Laureate John Burroughs, our own Tony Brewer, and a Hawaiian disability poet, Sharma Murphy. She's Hale, which means white woman from Hawaii, but she's quite marvelous. And we'll be having music by saxophonist Catherine Sakura. So I hope you can join us then. And um, I hope you have a wonderful evening tonight. Our very own Kyle Cross is playing over at the Block House. So if you're blooming in Bloomington, you can join Tony and me over going over to the Black House to catch the second set. And uh, once again, fantastic poems, fantastic music, fantastic film. Thank you so much, everybody.